Thanks for joining us online today. We hope you're blessed by this message. If you have a prayer need today, please visit our website, SiouxFallsFirst.com. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, saints. Morning, saints. Well, it's good to be here. Um, I grew up in Sioux City, and uh, yeah, those pictures on the screen were wonderful. I, Seventy some years ago, my family used to bring me up here to the old church downtown when uh, Pastor Berg was the pastor. Used to sing for him when I was a little boy. And then uh, the Tubers preached here when Brother Tuber was here. And, and Paul Sandgren, my goodness, I feel like I'm home. And it's so good to be with my precious sweet cousin Fonda. She... Um, when I grow up, I want to be just like her. She's, uh, I could have told you she was a legend a long time ago. Love Fonda so dearly. We're first cousins. There's only five or six of us left, but, but we're more like brother and sister. And uh, so thank you for the privilege, Pastor, coming here to be with you today. Uh, my wife, Darlene, is right back here. Stand up, honey. I'm so proud of my girl. <laughs> We're coming up on our 60th wedding anniversary. That's a long time. Isn't it? I remember when I thought that people who had been married that long were just old geezers. <laughs> and we are. <laughs> we are. <laughs> turned out that way. Hey. Well, it's so good to be in the house of God this morning. I've been pastoring for a long time. I love pastoring. I love people. And I love the ministry. I don't understand burnout. I understand wear out, but I don't understand burnout. I love the ministry. We are Pentecostal people. Pentecost, of course, means harvest. Harvest, that's what Pentecostal people are. Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They're on Mount Zion on the south end of Jerusalem. Suddenly came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Didn't say it was a wind, said it sounded like one. Filled all the house where they were sitting I love the word sitting. That's a sacred word, sitting. The older I get, the more I love the word sitting. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was poured out in a place where the people were sitting. sitting. And yet we Pentecostals today think we have to stand up all the time. And If you want to have a revival, sit down. <laughs> That's all I wanted to tell you. Thanks for coming. Filled all the house where they were sitting there, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That all happened on the day of Pentecost, which was the annual Jewish day of harvest. Pentecost means harvest. If you're a Pentecostal church, you're a harvesting church at home and around the world. I told the first service this morning that one of my board members said, Pastor, let's change the name of First Assembly to what you say we're supposed to be. I said, well, what? Let's call our church International Harvester. That's what we are. Uh, the ser sermon I preached, I, I can't preach two sermons in a row, same thing, so I'm going to go a little different direction, but get the first tape, and then this morning, what are they, $40, $50, something like that, <laughs> and uh, then you'll know the kind of the basis for this message, which is harvesting. Of, of all the people 
in the world, Pentecostal people ought to be cutting edge people. Starts off the very first page in your Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. The Hebrew says the earth became without form and void. I wish what happened. I knew what happened. Probably when Satan was cast in onto the earth. The earth became void and dark. The Holy Spirit began to brood on the face of the deep. I do that for those of you who have no imagination whatsoever. <laughs> and out of that brooding, the Holy Spirit moved and God spoke, let there be light. Thousands of light. Thousands and thousands of lights all over the cosmos. God said, Whew. well now, Brother Dan, he didn't. He said, God said, that's good. Listen to me. <laughs> the whole atmosphere is this inky blackness. And all of a sudden, it's alive in this cosmic laser show. And God said, that's good. I don't think so. I think God said to the angels, blow it out. I want to do that again. Whew. It all started with the power of the Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit that baptized me as a teenage kid down in Sioux City, which was the seminal moment in my life. What, to speak in tongues? No, no, no. That's the initial physical evidence of the baptism. But the baptism is power. You think different. You are different. Your faith increases. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What is faith? Positive thinking? No, 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 no. Hebrews 11, what Hebrews says that faith is the substance. It is something you can stand on. It's not an emotion. It's not the warm fuzzies. It's not some ethereal flyby. No, no, faith is substance. Of what? Of things you've longed for. Dreamed of. Doesn't seem to be a clue that they'll happen. But you keep believing. Now, put on your thinking cap a minute. Both the Old and New Testament tell us that God is not willing that one person perish. You got a lot of people here in Sioux Falls. And several hundred thousand people overall. God is not willing that even one of them be lost. Therefore, there has to be a way to reach them. Boy, what a great place to say amen. And you just said that. There has to be a way to reach them. Otherwise, God is cruel and arbitrary. There's not one person in Sioux Falls or the world that can't be reached. And here's where most Pentecostals fall down on the job. They say, well, we've never done that before. Because it's comfortable. And as I get older, you know, I'm pushing 80. As I get older, I, I like to be set in my ways. But I can't be because the world is changing. And the gospel has to be sent out around the world. And it can be, but we've got to think differently. Now, I'll give you an illustration. About 15 years ago, down to First Assembly in Fort Myers, on an Easter Sunday, for the first time, we hit 2,000 in attendance. Boy, I was pumped. Got home and I said to Darlene, 2,000 people, huh? And my precious wife, whom God gave me, said, well, that's wonderful, honey. There's just about 500,000 to go. I have a fabulous staff, pastoral staff. I, I love my staff. We've got about 15, 16 pastors on the staff. and Every one of them is smarter than I am, truthfully. Otherwise, why do I need them? If, if I'm going to hire somebody that doesn't know any more about it than I do, why, why do I need them? 
So everybody on that staff in their area of ministry is infinitely smarter than I am. And I just lose them and let them go. They're, they're brilliant. So every Monday morning we meet in my office and we have these brainstorming sessions. So it's the Monday after this big Easter. I was so pumped and I said, wow, we had 2,000 Easter Sunday. Let's shoot for 5,000 next year. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, nobody, nobody would say we can't do that or they wouldn't be there for the next staff meeting. So they said, yeah, that's great. And then one of them said, how do we do that? I don't know. That's why I got you. It's the pastor's job to dream. It's your job to pull it off. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> so we got to thinking about it. And one of the guys said, hey, um, we can't seat 5,000 people. Where are we going to put them? Well, now that's a good question. The Minnesota Twins had just built a new spring training baseball park. Gorgeous in Fort Myers. It would seat about 8,000 people. So one of the guys said, let's do it at Minnesota Twins Spring Training Park. I've never done that before. How do we do that? I don't know. I said, well, let me make a phone call. So while they were all watching, listening, I picked up the phone and called the number of the twins. Somebody answered the phone. I said, I'm Pastor Betzer at First Assembly, and I'd like to speak to somebody about using the Minnesota. It sounds so preposterous even telling you. We'd like to use the Minnesota Twins Stadium for Easter Sunday. And we'll need it all day Saturday for rehearsals, Saturday night with all the lights on, and then Sunday. And I said, well, nobody's ever asked for that before. He said, uh, hang on, I'll call you back. So I hung up and the staff and I were just sitting there waiting. The phone rings back and the guy said, uh, yeah, we'll do that. We'll let you have the Minnesota Twin beautiful ballpark. I said, well, I forgot to tell you, we need all the other diamonds too because we're going to set up tents for young people and children and so forth. That's not a problem. And I said, we're going to need it till about 3 o'clock because we're going to feed a lot of people, I think. And so we're going to need it all day Saturday, lights on, and all day, most of the day Sunday. No problem. You can have it, Rev. I said, well, how much? Well, he said, uh, we'll let you rent all of that for a hundred bucks. I said, could we have it every weekend? <laughs> because I know a church going up for sale if we can. hundred bucks. No, he said, but you can have it that day. He said, that'd just be great. Now, he said, um, we got a ball game at 3 o'clock, so you got to have everything cleared off by 3. The players take the infield for practice at 3 o'clock. I said, we'll do it. He said, would you uh, have any young person in your church that can sing the national anthem? I said, sure. He said, uh, well, one more thing. Do you have anybody in the church who could throw out the first pitch? <laughs> I said, you got a good catcher, man. I, I got a gun on this arm. I, I'm your man. I'm your man. So we're going to get this place for $100. Then one of the guys on the staff said, okay, we got the place. How do we fill it? That is the question, isn't it? Joel wrote that, without, that, that, that in the last days, there has to be vision. Old men dream dreams, see vision. Your young people see vision. The vision is how you pull off the dream. Proverbs says where there's no vision, people die. See, that's where this whole thing falls apart. We're going to reach our city for Christ. Yay! We're going to reach the world. Yay! We're going to set new records in missions giving. Yay! How? And that's where it falls apart. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. So one of the fellows said, uh, let's, uh, let's bring in Convoy of Hope. I said, that's a great idea. Then he said, let's bring in homeless people from all over the area. And uh, they'll help fill the stadium and Convoy of Hope will feed them. They'll bring in tons of, 
of uh, non-perishable and we'll bring in more tons of perishable. That's how we're going to do that. Then somebody said, well, how do we get these homeless people even here? They don't have transportation. So somebody said, well, let's call, let's call the city transportation bus company and see if they will run by here every, every route they take. So I called the bus transportation and they said, well, yeah, we'll run buses by on Easter Sunday. All of our routes will come by the stadium. Man, now we're going to feed these people. The people came from everywhere. We fed seven and a half thousand people that day. We've had as many as 20,000 show up on a Sunday. But you gotta go where you've never gone before. And you gotta do what you've never done before. Well, we can't do that. What do you think the baptism's for? That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for. is to make you the most creative, dynamic, God-honoring people on the planet. There is nothing that cannot be done. Now, real quickly, I'll go back to the early service here, early mass here this morning. <laughs> Darlene and I have been married a long time, and 50-some years ago, we started a church in Ohio, northern Ohio. We pastored four churches, three of them we started, much easier than <laughs> than the other way. And uh, we started this little church, and after about a year, we had about 80, 90 people, but no money. We had a cute little tabernacle church, seat about 120, 30 people, but no money. Now, this is 50-some years ago. Our whole budget for our church, annual budget, was $16,000, one six zero zero zero. And we couldn't even come close. We needed $300 a week where we're getting $200. So I'd preach on tithing. Amen, pastor. We believe in tithing. Amen. Preach it. Pass the plate. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I called, I called Springfield, our beloved headquarters, because we were so far in arrears, I wanted to borrow some money. This pastor Betts are up in Sandusky, Ohio. No hablo inglés, senor. Hung up on me. I don't know. So what do we do? And I got very sick because I don't handle financial pressure well. And while I was sick, God began to speak to my heart about missions. He said, the reason I'm not blessing you financially is because you're not in the same business I'm in. You're in the church business. I'm in the redemption business. About 40% of our Assemblies of God churches are in the church business. Forty percent of our churches never had a single missionary last year. Think about that. Twenty percent of all of our churches never gave a dime to missions. They're not Pentecostal. They have a name, they live, but they're dead. So God said, you're not in the business I'm in. I said, what do you want me to do? And God said, three things. I want you to have a missions convention. <laughs> and I said, oh, God. Have you ever been to a missions convention? Oh, man, that's Yon City. <laughs> you young people don't remember this, but there used to be a thing called slides. <laughs> and missionaries would bring their little projectors and their slides and their little clickers and the house light would go out and I've seen this over and over down in Sioux City I saw it every here we have a picture of a tree this is another tree got a whole bunch of trees right here these are trees in Africa there's a hut there somewhere in those trees it's just terrible and my hand on this Bible, or you won't believe this. One missionary came through. This is a picture of my wife and our pet chimpanzee. My wife is the one on the left. <laughs> the truth. <laughs> and 
And then there was, then there's always that obligatory final slide. Here we see the sun sinking into the sea and the light is going out when no man can work. <laughs> then the house lights would come back on all over the church. <laughs> That's a missions convention. God said, no, no, no. I'll teach you how to run a missions convention. It will become the motor of your church. We had to start our missions convention down in Fort Myers in just about two weeks. Goes for 10 days. It's the motor. It's why we exist. So God said, have a missions convention. I said, okay. Then the Lord said, I want you to bring in as your speaker, Dr. Oswald J. Smith. 50 some years ago, Dr. Smith was the pastor of the People's Church in Toronto. Billy Graham called him the greatest influence on his life. In fact, Graham preached Smith's funeral, finally. Smith wrote 1,500 hymns. He wrote 50-some best-selling books. He was the, he and Harold Rockingay were the great pioneers of missions and the faith promise movement. So how am I, I got a little dinky home missions church up in Ohio. How am I supposed to get him? God said, ask him. And Smith wrote me back. He said, I feel God telling me to invest a week of my life in you. Changed my life. So we're going to have a missions convention. We're going to bring in Smith. Then God said, I want you to have a faith promise goal. A faith promise is not a pledge. Down in Fort Myers, people use the word pledge. We wash their mouth out with soap. Lava soap. <laughs> because it's not a pledge and it's not semantics. A pledge is what you and I can do out of our budget. That's zilch. That's why people tighten up when you talk about this. I don't have any money. I understand that. I'm not really talking about your money. We're talking to Pentecostal people about how God makes you a channel a conduit, a hose. And supernaturally, oh, there's the word. What, what's the difference in a Pentecostal church and a good civic club? Not much. They all have regular meetings. They sometimes eat together. Sometimes they have dues. We call it tithes. What's the difference in a church and a civic club? Not much. Unless... The supernatural is there. You cannot explain a true Pentecostal church except by the supernatural. For goodness sakes, people, that's why we're Pentecostal. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. We don't have the Holy Spirit so we can sing little choruses and jiggle. We have the sole Holy Spirit who gives us the power. Jesus said, ye shall receive power. Power. I wonder what he meant by that. Is it possible he meant we could have power and be witnesses to the whole world? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what a faith promise is. What would God do through me? So the Lord says, I want you to have a faith promise this first year of $20,000. This is 50 years ago. I said, Lord, let me explain something to you. <laughs> See, our whole budget is $16,000. We don't have $20,000. God said, you let me explain something to you. You do what I tell you, I'll take care of your budget. You know what the first thing churches cut when things get tough? Missions. You might as well just cut your throat. We had, in, down in Fort Myers, when that... Depression or recession, whatever you call it, hit us eight years ago. We were the second hardest hit mortgage foreclosure city in the country. Churches were hurting. The Baptist church dropped half. Finances went down. The board said, what do we do? I said, well, let's add 25 missionaries to our monthly support. Really? Yeah. I mean, what, what, what did God do? Just suddenly shrink up? We sing, how great thou art. And then, ooh, what are we going to do? Is God greater, isn't he? 
Our God is a marvelous, majestic. Well, is he or isn't he? I believe he is. I don't believe God's passed out in months. So God said, I want you to have a faith promise of $20,000. So try to explain that to a church. So the day comes, Smith's coming in. We're going to start the convention. And that night we had, the church was pretty full, about 100 people so. And uh, I didn't know Smith. I'm expecting a motivator, a shooter type person with, this is the day the Lord hath made, you know. Now, I got a cranky, cantankerous old codger out of Canada. One of the most cantankerous men I ever met. So I introduced him. And um, this is what happened. We're, we're glad to have Dr. Smith here today. Let's welcome him as he comes. You people make me sick. <laughs> Did you ever have your whole life just... <sighs> I saw in the audience, what did he say, Maud? He said, we make him sick. <laughs> and I leaned over, Darlene's over by the piano, and I just mouthed one word to her, pack. Believe in here, babe. He was brutal. He said, who do you people think you are? How many times have you heard the gospel? A hundred? Thousand? Fifty? How many times have you heard the gospel? You got out of your nice little houses, got in your air-conditioned little cars, came to this little chapel church. You're sitting in cushioned pews. You've heard the gospel over and over. What, what do you want me to do? A soft shoe for you? Who do you think you are? Boy, that's the truth. First four years of my life were lived down in Climbing Hill, just outside of Sioux City. I was there a couple of weeks ago. Climbing Hill has 93 people living in it. 93. They have three churches. One for every 31 people. There are cities in this world of hundreds of thousands of people who have no church. Now you tell me if that's fair. We've heard it over and over and over again, over and over again. And so much of the world's never heard at one time. So what do we do about it? So Monday night, he was brutal. I was so mad at him. I wanted motivation. I didn't want to be skinned alive. I drove him back to the hotel that night. I just, I didn't even talk to him. I was so mad at him. But some of those people don't care. They hear different music. They don't care if you like them or not. They're great leaders. We Americans want to be stroked. Sometimes we need to be kicked, you know. So I thought, I got Monday night. Boy, it's going to be brutal. There won't be anybody there. Me and Darlene and Smith, that's it. <laughs> Wasn't sure Darlene was coming. <laughs> so I picked up Smith that night, and we drove onto the parking lot, and it was packed with cars. Guy said, give me a key to your car. Your spot's taken. I'll park your car for you. I said, why are all these people here? Thought maybe one of them had a rope, you know, going to have a little news party or something that night. We went up the back steps, and they were putting chairs in the aisle. And I thought, well, Lord, aren't you merciful? And, and, and give Smith a chance to pour in the oil tonight and stroke us a little bit. He was worse. And he just ripped our skin off. Tuesday night, they had to put chairs up out in the lobby. I thought, what kind of people are we dealing with here? You want to be hurt? You want to have your skin just ripped off your hide? Come to our church. But who, who, are, who are these people? That's the night that changed my life. Yeah. Never been the same. God began to deal with me. I'm sitting behind Smith over here. God says, you believe what that old man's saying? 
Yeah, I'd never heard it like that before. I'd always heard missions in kind of a mild vanilla form, you know. I'd just never had my heart ripped out. Yeah, I believe that. God said, good, sell your car and give the money to missions. What? Sell your car and give the money to me. I had a car I loved. Why? It was only a year old. I only had 24 more payments on it. It was a Pontiac Bonneville, one of those big, long, fin jobbies. Man, I loved that car. I got home that night. I thought, God would never ask me to do that. I love my car. Darlene said, God tell you tonight to sell our car and give the money to missions. Yeah. Well, we better do it. So the next morning, I put an ad in the paper. I know how tough it is to sell a car outright. And I put a price on that car that only a moron would pay. <laughs> next Monday, I watched the moron drive it away. <laughs> Had the money. So I said to Darlene, I'll go down and pay off the lien on this car. And she said, no, no, I think God wants it all. I said, we'll go to prison. We got a lien here. She said, you go explain it to that old banker. Went downtown to that gorgeous bank building, which our church later bought. Man. And I explained to him, and he said, that'll be fine. Just write your signature on here. So all the money went to the missionary. Well, I'm a home missions pastor. I can't make two payments. And I got, we don't have a good, well, we had an old beat up, green, rusted out rambler. I hate ramblers. <laughs> if you die and go to hell, Satan's going to say, welcome to hell. Here's your car. It's a rambler. <laughs> hate that car. And I had a bad attitude about it for months until... I got pictures from the missionary of the church that he had built with that money. Not like this. Cement slab, steel posts, corrugated tin. Hundreds of people somewhere in Africa worshiping God. Where they still are decades after that Pontiac has turned to rust on a junkyard somewhere. You say, well, God gave you a new car, right? No, no, you've been watching Christian TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a lot of baloney. No. Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll take it from a grouch, too. <laughs> I had that crummy Nash for about six, seven months until I got those pictures. Car didn't change, I changed. I went, guys, you won't believe this, but I went down for lunch and got in that old car. And if you look at a Rambler, you, you gotta have the sun just right. But if you look at it kind of like this, it kind of looks like a Bentley. You know what? Old things pass away. And all things become new. Now the money from that car, notwithstanding, that was a whole different thing. But that Sunday morning, we received the offering, the faith promise offering for missions. That little church gave... $32,000 to missions. And you know what happened? The tithing doubled overnight. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and signs and wonders will follow. They never come first. They never proceed. We wait, for the, we wait for the wonders to come, and then out of that, we'll, no, it doesn't work like that. Obedience comes first, and then come the blessings. 
we began to grow. In one year, we went from 80 to 300. Did you ever trust God? What, what would God do through you this next year? In a few moments when uh, your pastor directs you in filling out the faith promise card, not a pledge. We can't reach many people with pledges. But faith promise is supernatural. 29 years ago, Darlene and I were elected down in First Assembly in Fort Myers. I didn't want to go there. It was a torn up, beat up church, gone through a number of splits. I didn't want to be there. And uh, they owed millions of dollars. There were 800 and some people there the night I got elected and 400 left the first year. They didn't want any kind of discipleship. They didn't want to have responsibility. They sure didn't want to hear about missions. They just wanted to play. So I started preaching the word and boy, people left in droves. Had my car blown up in my driveway. The guy tried to kill us one night, one of our members. They ain't nobody as mean as mean Assemblies of God people. We're meaner than Baptists. Because <clears throat> the Baptist can be mean and shoot, he's still going to heaven anyway. <laughs> they are secure. But Assemblies of God people know when they're mean, they're going to burn in hell. That just makes them meaner. Had the windows in the church shot out. I've had pastors say, you just at the right place at the right time. Oh, yeah? You want to hear a real story? I prayed every day, God, get me out of here. And God said, Dan, you're such a slow learner. Have a missions convention. God, I'm going to explain this to you. We owe millions of dollars here. We're about four months out of receivership. Going to lose this property. God said to me, God said to me, I don't care about your property. Your property means nothing to me. We pastors are such strange dudes. We build these buildings and we say to God, God, hey, look. And God looks down and he goes, wow. Why can't we do that up here? <laughs> God said, I'll take care of your building. You do what I tell you to do. Turned that church around. Since then, they've given well over $30 million to missions. Thousands of people come now. Do you know that all over Sioux Falls, there are people who are looking desperately for a place just like this? We say, nobody wants to hear the gospel. Are you kidding me? They desperately want to hear the gospel. I go on a somewhat regular basis, 300 miles north of town, up to a little town called Stark in Florida. It's where our penitentiary is. It's where death row is. We have 407 guys waiting their turn on the gurney and get the needle. I walk among those guys. The gospel melts the toughest heart. One of the most brutal killers in Florida history grabbed me around the shoulders the other day. He said, Dan, nobody in the world cares if I live or die but you. And I love you. Tell me about Jesus. We're Pentecostal. There's something inside you that have you ever let it come out? That's what this faith promise is all about. What, what would God do through you in this next year? Your faith promise card, why don't you take it out for just a minute? Your faith promise card, you all have one. If you don't have one, hold up your hand and somebody will get to you. And if you, if you don't have one, lightning's going to hit you right there in the chair. Everybody, young and old, faith promise. 
my mission's faith promise. As God enables me, that's what it says. Not your job, not your employer, not your savings account, if you have one. As God enables me. Here, see, we're taking a step away from the normal, way over here to the supernatural. God, would you do something in me in this next year above and beyond anything I have that I could invest in missions? I've had people in our church down in Fort Myers who years ago, they'd say, well, I have $50 a month. But now I'm believing God. I've seen some of them give two, $3,000 every month. And they don't make that kind of money. They don't get that kind of funding just to get a new car or a second house. God wants you rich. God wants you productive. Big difference. As God enables me, I will help take the message of Jesus into all the world by giving through the missions program of my local church. You know, Fonda, all my life I want to be a missionary. Our son David spent 17 years in Africa as a missionary, but God never let me be a missionary. And some years ago, I was over in Calcutta in India and just moaning and groaning, and Lord, why don't you let me be a missionary? God said, you are a missionary. You are a missionary of supply. If our armies don't have supply routes, they lose the war. We are missionaries of supply. And we cannot reach this world by normal means. It has to be by His Spirit, O oh Lord God. So that's what this is about. You can do it weekly, monthly. We also add one one-time gift if you like that. Now in a moment as you fill this out, we're going to pray and then the pastor's coming. If you fill this out and you really feel comfortable with it, God probably didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> because uh, what God calls us to do takes us into the supernatural. Heavenly Father, there's such an anointing in this place today. I pray, oh God, that this congregation is going to be able to enable missionaries at home and around the world in an unprecedented way. When this offering is announced, may it elicit shock because it's not possible. But you do things that are not possible. And we are the instruments that you use. Oh God, thank you for what you're going to do in this house today with these people, your people. Amen. Amen. Pastor, if you'll come. Thank you, Dan, for the awesome challenge. You know, God is very serious about the mission. From Genesis to Revelation, that's what it's about. And I've been thinking about, even recently, all the talk about what's happening in the Middle East and how the, the Word of God is prophetically happening and blood moons and all these things. And I, I, I think that's great but it can't distract from the mission. It can't be something we say, let's, let's focus on this and let's wait for Jesus to come. Our bags are packed. When he said, work while it's day because there's coming a time when man will work no more. As long as there's lost people, we still have work to do. And we should live every day ready because he can come at any moment and take his church but God, help us to be motivated by the lost people in Sioux Falls and around the world.